Welcome, everyone, to the L7C podcast, Women's College Gymnastics Off-Season Edition. Today, we are going to be uh, getting you up to date on what's been going on in women's college gymnastics during the off-season. Last time you heard us talk women's gymnastics, the championship just concluded, and Oklahoma won again. So that's been months ago, and now we have our women's gymnastics expert back Miss Sarah Bogan, how are you doing today? Oh, I'm doing well, but I'm very tired. But I'm very happy to be here. It's happy to have you back. These past couple of months have been kind of weird without you. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I feel like we were doing pretty regular updates during the season. Um, but it's super fun to be back because um, we've had a really crazy off season so far in the women's gymnastics world. And I think it's definitely worth reconvening and debriefing on it all. So before we get into the women's gymnastics uh, portion of this podcast, you've been gone for a couple months. What have you been up to? Oh, my goodness. So much. So basically, as soon as the summer started, um, I finished up my semester, submitted my grades, um, and pretty quickly started having a crazy summer. So I actually attended my first in-person research conference since COVID. Um, in May, uh, presented some work there, immediately started preparing for my PhD comprehensive exam, which are a pretty stressful milestone in that program. So in June, I passed those, um, then pretty immediately flew to Toronto for a workshop where I got together and worked on some research with some collaborators, came back and then immediately hit the ground running, trying to finish my master's in statistics, which I defended this past Friday. So um, after I do a couple more edits on my written master's thesis, I will have an MS in statistics, and that's super exciting. Yeah, it definitely seems like you've been doing a lot, uh, a lot of traveling, a lot of, a lot of, lot of schoolwork, but you're doing a great job, but it's sounding like you're getting closer and closer to the end of the tunnel. Yes. So the last big milestone I have for my PhD before the defense itself is I have um, a dissertation to proposal defense I need to write up and hoping to get that defended by November. And then after that, I'm hoping to have everything finished for my PhD within a year of that. So it's finishing. It's coming quick, which is a great feeling after all of these years. After all these years. Excuse me. I'm sure all of your fans who do listen to this podcast and all of your friends and family are definitely rooting for you so that next time, well, not next time, but later in the year, you'll be getting the introductions, getting called Dr. Sarah Bogan. Yes. Um, and I'm very honored to be among, I will be very honored to be among multiple PhDs we already have on the crew. Yeah. With so. Cassie and uh, Chelsea. Yeah. So, you were super busy and all that, and the off season did not do you any favor. It didn't slow down. It actually sped up. There was a whole bunch of things going on, and Sarah, I just want you to take it away on where you want to start with which off season thing you want to go to first, and we'll just oh my go. Yeah, so um, off season is usually pretty interesting, at least in terms of coaching shuffles. So a lot of times. There will be like major coaching changes, um, especially among assistant coaching ranks. So every coaching staff in the NCAA has up to four members. So the NCAA allows you to have a head coach, um, two assistants, one of which can be an associate head coach. Um, and then there's also a volunteer assistant coach position that programs can take advantage of. Um, so there's usually a lot of movement in um, assistant coaches. But this year was unique in that there were some really, really big head coaching changes. Um, and this was also made extra crazy by um, the addition of two new, really exciting programs. So that's where I'd like to start with the new universities, new schools, new teams that we're going to be having in college gymnastics. Oh, go just go right in. Go right ahead. Okay. So the first that people are really excited about um, which actually isn't going to be an NCAA program yet, but they're working on it, um, is Fisk University, which is in Tennessee. And it's a historically black college and university. And so this is actually the first HBCU ever to sponsor a women's gymnastics program. 
So um, this was announced um, at some point during this past year that this was going to be happening. And they are all set to start competing this coming season. So they've been doing a really awesome job getting that program up and running. Um, Corinne Tarver is the head coach there. Um, and she has a lot of distinctions as the first Black gymnast to compete for the University of Georgia. That was back in their heyday. She was the first Black gymnast um, to have NCAA championships to her name. And she's just building a really exciting program. A lot of student athletes have already committed. Uh, she has a team all set up and ready to go. Um, for now, they are competing in the NAIA rather than, than the NCAA because FISC as a whole hasn't been, um, it isn't an NCAA school yet, but they're hoping within the next couple of years to transition into NCAAs so that um, all the gymnasts on that team can vie for NCAA championships along with everybody else, which is super, super exciting. Yeah, the only thing I want to add on that too is like for people who are like, oh, they're in the NI, NAIA, and not the NI. For someone who has had direct experience with the NAIA for the past junior four, six years with my own siblings playing uh, top professional, well, top college sports in there, that conference, it, it's not a sl like it's not a slouch. It's the real deal. There are real athletes there. Just for the people who don't know because i've seen all the athletes firsthand i've lived with them so it's a real deal and it's a big big thing for um fisk i think also this also is going to go into like the clemson thing as well mm -hmm. with these new programs are they giving their coaches are they going to give their coaches enough adequate time to build a program like are these schools going to expect them to I want you in the final four against Oklahoma in the next three years. If you don't make it there, you're, you're out of here. Like, are they going to give, because all these, all sports are different. Like football, they don't give their coaches time anymore. If you're not in a championship in three years, you're out of here. So it's like, are those schools going to give these places and these coaches enough time to actually build, recruit, establish that fan base and all that? Yeah, I mean, gosh, I sure hope so, especially on, you know, for Fisk. I think one thing I'll say about Fisk before um, we can definitely move on to Clemson, because that's also big news. But like something I just want to make sure I really reiterate about Fisk is that um, there has been push for a really long time for an HBCU to take on gymnastics. So the past two, well, past three, really, um, the past three uh, Olympic all-around champions have been women of color from the United States. So mm -hmm. going back to Gabby Douglas in 2012, and of course, Simone dominating um, mm -hmm. since then. Um, and then SUNY, of course, she's not, she's not Black, but she is a woman of color. And um, there have been a lot of discussions just kind of more broadly. And we talked about this a little bit um, with the UCLA situation this past year that gymnastics remains just a primarily white sport. Um, and there's a lot of power in having an entire team full of women of color. Um, and so there's, because of that, there's already just a massive amount of support for Fisk and such. And so they're already building up an amazing fan base. So in that way, I think, um, the excitement that already exists for Fisk is going to help them a lot. Um, and just the symbolism of having that team, even if they don't have championships right away, I think it's going to be really important. And I think I can see um, support for that school and like allowances for that program to grow. So you said something actually really, really interesting and don't want to gloss over it about you have these past three champions who have been mm -hmm. deemed the best on the planet. The one in the middle, Simone, has been deemed not just the best on the planet, the best who's ever lived to this point in 2022. And it's yes, going to be exactly. really hard for whatever one-year-old or whoever many, many years from now to reach her status. But currently, she's the best ever. And how you said it's a predominantly white sport, which... 
this kind of goes to like other sports too, like a soccer or something like that. Is the price of admission when you're younger, is it too high where obviously the economic pay gap and things like that between races, is it just too much that it's hard for uh, minorities to get in? Because I have a younger brother who got a full scholarship because of his ability to play basketball, but those travel leagues, AAU, I mean, it cost my parents a lot of money. And obviously the end goal is for your child to get a full ride and potentially play professionally. Like these parents, they're paying a lot of money. So that's why I always wanted to ask you since you brought it up. Is it the, is the price Mm -hmm. to even get in gymnastics like way too high, especially when you're talking about the, the real, like the, I don't want to say the real because like the travel leagues and like the AU stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I I mean, the socioeconomic issues behind it are a big driver. Um, And then there's also just, there are a lot of traditions and aesthetics and issues like that working against Mm -hmm. gymnasts of color as well. And so I'd recommend, I'm definitely, I don't pretend to be an expert on this, but I would definitely recommend if, um, people wanted to learn more if our listeners wanted to learn more about the forces um preventing on like being a challenge for gymnasts of color the organization brown girls do gymnastics is super incredible they have a lot of great resources and they provide a lot of great support they were um really a force behind pushing for hbcu gymnastics teams and perhaps the best, I know, um, assuming if people are listening to this podcast, they're um, prone to listen to other podcasts. So there's a podcast called American Prodigy, the most recent um, the most recent season of it. They changed it to American Prodigies. Um, and they made it all about the rise of um, Black and African-American gymnasts in the U.S. And they go through a lot of the issues and a lot of um, they cover a lot of topics. So I definitely recommend checking that out. Um, and I think listening to that would give our listeners a really good insight into why this FISC team is so exciting and why this issue is so important. Do you know like an estimate ballpark? What's the average cost for an elite travel gymnast is going to be? Their parents are going to be forking up. Oh, it's a lot. <laughs> It's a lot. Um, I don't have a number for you, but it's definitely. I've heard it compared to college tuition. And a lot of people can't pay that twice if you're going to be paid all that for elite gymnastics and then they don't get a scholarship and then you're having to pay that again for college. A lot of normal Americans can't do that twice. Not at all. Yeah, that's what uh, like a lot of. That's why there's like a lot of pressure yep. on these gymnasts to get that college scholarship. And it's just, it's wild. It's absolutely wild. But going from Fisk to those Tigers at Clemson, Clemson is starting oh up goodness. something yes. as well, along with the whole ACC. Yes. So Clemson University, they actually announced, they announced this about a year ago. Um, that they were planning on um, starting a women's gymnastics program. Um, so Clemson is an ACC school. It's a yep. big deal. Clemson sports fans more broadly are very passionate mm-hmm. fans. Um, so Clemson announced the addition of women's gymnastics at the same time that they announced the addition of women's lacrosse. Mm-hmm. So they're going to be starting, both teams are going to be starting in the 2024 season. So this next season, um, 2022 to 2023, um, we won't see the Clemson Tigers at all, but um, in 2024, they're going to be starting. This is exciting because it's a new gymnastics program. It's a new gymnastics program that we're going to expect to be really well supported and have a lot of resources to be able to attract and entice really good gymnasts. Um, and it's also really exciting because for the first time, the ACC will sponsor gymnastics for the first time. So. Um, the other ACC schools that already have gymnastics are Pitt, University of North Carolina, and NC State. They have been competing in EGLE, or the East Atlantic Gymnastics League, which is similar to the MG- MRGC that we've talked about. It's a conglomerate of schools that don't have a home conference to compete in. So between NC State, UNC, Pitt, and now Clemson, we'll start seeing ACC gymnastics 
Um, and so it'll be interesting to see what happens when we have another Power Five conference um, supporting and promoting gymnastics in the NCAA. There are big guns coming to Clemson. So that's definitely, definitely a program to watch. So for the people who don't know, like, just to educate them, why didn't the ACC sponsor, did they not think it was a profitable thing? Like, why did they never sponsor it? Mm, so the reason, so the reason was because there weren't enough schools within the ACC that had gymnastics. Okay. So previously, it was only three schools, Pitt, UNC, and NC State. So typically, they require four teams. Um, and like this is the case for like the Big West as well, you know, where Utah State is. Um, so typically, like four is kind of the critical mass okay. of teams that they'll need to like, kind of start and sponsor a championship. Well, so that, that is, is why. why. And you could tell that. Sarah has been around her couple of episodes because she is hitting these transition points oh so well. We, we talked about Utah State and going into the coaching thing. Yes, you lost the coach. You lost the head. What's what's going I know. on? Yes. So this is another thing that has been uh, hard for me on this off season. So I've had all these personal things and professional things, and also I've been going through just a lot with my team and the team that I love and support the most, which is my home team, Utah State. So something that is exciting, but also heartbreaking for me is that there was a lot of buzz, you know, there was uh, a lot of knowledge that Clemson was going to be hiring their head coach at the end of the season. Uh, and that head coach that they hired is Amy Smith, who was previously head coach at Utah State. And so uh, Amy Smith was coached by Clemson, um, which means uh, in addition to Clemson starting, Utah State is now in a massive transition phase. So this is like what I said with the coaching shuffle. But usually there are a lot of um, assistant coaching positions that shuffle around, but head coaches moving causes this crazy trickle down effect. I have a question so, for you. Amy Smith is so with yes. Amy going. You said because you said the perfect word poached. Do you know if, yes. like, was it a money thing? Did Utah State not counter Clemson's offer? Like, if she's been – because not just – she didn't just leave by herself. Like, people went with her. So, do yes. you, like, why yes. – I guess what enticed her to leave the program that she had now and go to a unproven, untested, all that program? I just want to know if Utah just didn't offer the same amount of money. Yeah, I, well, I have no doubt that it's a money thing. I also think that it speaks to, so I'm not, I'm not that in the know about the mm -hmm. ACC and I wasn't very in the know about Clemson, but I think it speaks to just how powerful and how many resources Clemson University has because they were able to be just probably they were able to give just an unbelievable offer and an unbelievable opportunity for a new power five conference team to start. Like they're going to probably have, they're going to be building a brand new practice facility. Um, and that's better than Utah state could ever hope to offer. Um, and I have no doubt that those passionate fans and that exciting fan base is going to be just head and shoulders above what Utah State is able to offer in terms of fan experience and support as well. Um, and then academically, Clemson is an incredible university. So something that you hinted at um, is that in addition to Amy Smith leaving, um, she took six of Utah State's best gymnasts with her. And that was kind of the thing that hurt me. I, I don't want to say hurt because like, I want, like, I try really hard, you know, in my, um, my support of college gymnastics to kind of put the gymnasts mm -hmm. first in terms of who I support. And if this was their choice to go, or if this was their like opportunity that they got to go take advantage of, I want to support that no matter what, but I, I it's hard not to be hard, not to be heartbroken that, People like Rebecca Wells, who went all around at MRGC championships, isn't going to be competing here at Utah State anymore. Or Brie Clark, she we've talked about her a lot this year. She was an All-American on the floor. She does the Biles on the floor. Really wanted to see her do that in the spectrum. Um, and that's just to name a few. Uh, there are six gymnasts who went and just 
gymnasts that I loved watching, that I loved talking to when I went to the gym. And there will definitely be very good leadership in 2024 when when the gymnasts start up competing again. But I definitely feel um, quite a bit of sadness about not having them here at my school anymore. So while I- you were talking, because that is crazy, especially losing your best people, I wanted to see if uh, bringing up some representation in women's sports, all that jazz. There's like a list of like highest paid mm-hmm. women's gymnastics coaches and nothing I found was recent. The most recent thing was like 2019 about KJ Kindler, who one of the last things I said on our last thing is like, you need to put some more respect on her name. And this was back in 2019, mm-hmm. how she got approved that if she makes it through her 2025 season, she'll get like 3.1 million if she fulfills the stuff. Um, it's believed she's the nation's highest paid coach at this time. I would assume the lady who has multiple national championships is the highest paid. And this article from the transcript, the Norman transcript, was saying she was getting paid two hundred twenty-five to 280000 base. And then she had, like, other funds and all that. And I think that's oh. kind of crazy, too, that the best coach in a sport in college is only it's not only but getting paid 280,000 when you have the worst coach in another sport like let's say a college football they're getting paid like 3.2 million so mm-hmm. i was just wondering there's no way then that clemson offered her kj money because if they did then kj would have to go back to oklahoma's like hey if clemson's offering her this i need to get paid more of this or you got the potential of seeing her walk. I'm not saying she is, but if it's a money thing. But how is Utah State going to bounce back with losing their coach and their best gymnast? Like, did they also lose, like, incoming freshmen who were saying, like, I was going to come to the school because of Amy, but Amy's not coming there, so I'm going somewhere else. Does that happen too? Right. I'm not sure too much. Like, I'm not too sure about incoming freshmen. I wasn't too in the know about our incoming class. But I do want to mention, um, we have, so when it first happened, I was just floored. I was like heartbroken. Um, But things have been slowly falling into place for Utah State. So we did hire a new head coach. Um, Her name is Mm -hmm. Kristen White, Coach White. Um, So she, this is her first head coaching gig. Um, She was formerly an Arizona State assistant coach. So she brings that good Pac-12 experience. She used to be an Oklahoma gymnast, so she comes from that rich mm-hmm. tradition of very good gymnastics. Um, and she brought with her um, Arizona State's volunteer assistant coach, who used to be a Florida gymnast, okay. um, Rachel Slocum. Okay. So they have been working very hard to recruit and rebuild. Um, and they recently completed their coaching staff by hiring Robert Landini who is a very good hire, very exciting hire. He has previously coached at Utah, Denver, Florida, and Nebraska. He also used to coach Romania's junior junior national team. And he is he was on Florida coaching staff when they won national championships. Um, he's coached four NCAA vault champions. He is, brings a lot of experience to Utah State. Um, which I think will be in, a, in addition to you know Kristen and Rachel just being being great. He brings some more experience um, and something um, a little bit more shiny in terms of um, bling and previous success that um, will hopefully attract more people. Something else that happened recently um, is. Um, Kristen and Rachel successfully recruited two transfer students from Lindenwood, which is a Division II okay. school that, and a Division II team that does Division I quality gymnastics. Um, they've qualified to NCAA championships before, uh, or the championship tournament, at least. And so you can imagine how somebody from some, some of the best gymnasts from Lindenwood may be really attracted to the idea of coming to Utah State on scholarship and being in D1. So one thing about the six Utah State transfers who are now at Clemson is those are, I believe they were all scholarship athletes. So um, 
Utah State has these shiny scholarship spots that they're able to offer to um, current gymnasts um, who have you know, kind of proven themselves as well, kind of, as kind of attract attract new uh, new talent. So the rebuilding is still a work in progress. I have reached out to Kristen White on Twitter. I've let her know that, you know, I'm still here. I'm still willing to be super supportive. I still care about Utah State Gymnastics a lot. And um, a lot of people are rooting for them as they kind of rebuild. So Utah State is another team to watch in the coming year to see what kind of new uh, program they build with their new leadership and their new gymnasts. So you answered one of the questions I was going to ask about like how they're getting new people. It looks like they're already hitting the ball rolling, but part of being a new coach then is also coming into an environment that's already been established. And and instead of it's important to get the new people, how are they keeping the current Mm -hmm. gymnasts here? Like how are they making sure no one else is going to be like, I'm trying to go where Amy's at. I'm trying to go here. Like, how are they keeping the already the current Utah State gymnasts in house? Yeah, that's my biggest question and one of my biggest concerns. You know, I um, when I when I heard the news, you know, I mentioned you know just being like crazy heartbroken by the six transfers. I thought a lot about you know myself not being able to watch them in the spectrum anymore. But um, I also thought a lot about the current, the other current athletes who are left behind and the transition that it's going to be for them. And I just, I really hope, you know, the biggest thing I hope for, um, I am hoping for with this new coaching staff is a smooth transition for those current Mm -hmm. gymnasts. Um, I think about like Brianna Brooks and Danny Kirsten and um, Ariel Toomey and just like all, all the, all the women that, are still here that I love watching. Um, and I just, I want more than anything, a good next year or so for them. And so I haven't, I haven't talked with any of the current coaching staff yet. Um, and I haven't, I haven't chatted with any of the gymnasts. I don't know much about how they're feeling, but I definitely am thinking about them a lot and really, really hoping for that smooth transition for them. Uh, going there is a school that we have talked about since You've started um, on the L7C yes. uh, UCLA. Uh, yes. Chris resigned. I feel like this has been a, a, something. There was going to be major changes there, regardless of all the stuff they've gone through. And these are the steps. So mm-hmm. was he the only one who left or did everybody leave? Yeah. So Chris Waller, you know, UCLA had a really rough mm-hmm. season. Um a lot of uh, a lot of turmoil, a lot of criticism of Chris Waller and how he handled the whole situation with the um, racism mm-hmm. and um, problems with how that was handled. Um, so I was actually kind of surprised that he resigned because um, it seemed for the longest time like UCLA was going to try and um, brush everything under the rug. But um, especially after UCLA failed to qualify for nationals, I think that was kind of the nail in the coffin for Chris. So he announced his resignation shortly after NCAAs happened and the end of the season. That was kind of one of the big, another big uh, coaching Mm -hmm. change news was him stepping down. So um, usually what happens, and um, I'm sure this is probably the case for other sports, but like in gymnastics, it's kind of traditional that if a head coach leaves, most of the rest of the staff also Mm -hmm. leaves. Um the head coach hires their own staff. So um, Janelle McDonald from UC Berkeley was hired as the new um, head coach. Um, She had been the uneven bars specialist coach at Berkeley and coached that team to really good bars scores and such. Um, When she was announced as the new head coach, at UCLA, the response from the gymnast and the response from the gym turnout was all very positive in terms of her being just a good human um, and a good leader. Um, she previously coached at WOGA, which is the gym where um, people like Nastia Liukin, Carly Patterson, Maddie Koshin, Caitlin Ohashi all trained. Um, so she got really good uh, reviews from all of them. Simone's coach, Cecile Landy. Simone Biles coach used to coach there and used to coach with her. 
and said really good things. So um, overall, people seem to be pretty happy about Janelle McDonald and Coach McDonald taking over. So she did say when she came in, she definitely wanted to, you know, talk to all the current gymnasts and make sure there's a smooth transition. And she was open to keeping coaching staff on board. So she has announced the rest of her coaching staff. And the only person who stayed is BJ Doss, who used to be the volunteer assistant coach and was in charge of all of the floor choreography before. So BJ Doss has been promoted to a paid position. She's now the assistant coach. And between the two of them, they are kind of uh, BJ is the only holdover from the previous coaching staff. Yeah. So just like with, we were talking about coaching with Utah State, obviously her hers is a lot different than Utah State's because you're coming in there. There's a lot of mistrust. There's a lot of issues. Yes. Teammates ain't trusting teammates, ain't trusting the school, the mm-hmm. community. I still think that athletic director is still there. So mm-hmm. all of those things and you're coming into that and you're the one who get to give the speech like, Hey, we're going to have a different culture. I want you to stay at UCLA. Like we're, yeah. uh, it's not going to be the same thing. I promise. And obviously you're telling these gymnasts and athletes that, and yes, they are adults, but you also have to reaffirm that to their parents because it's like, if yes. their parents are like, Hey, I saw what my daughter went through. I don't want them at that school anymore. Like, I don't care if you're going to change it or not. It's not going to change quick enough for me to feel comfortable with my daughter staying at this school. And obviously, her going into living rooms telling parents that I know what you've heard about UCLA. That was not me. Word about this, 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 and this. So kudos to her and that staff because she has a lot of repairing she's going to have to do to get that school where they want to be. Yeah. And another um, kind of difference between um, Janelle and the situation at Utah State is UCLA is another one of those really big traditional programs that is expected to do really well. Um, You know, UCLA has won, I think, six national titles now. You know, it's, it's another team where the expectation is that there's going to be results. And I know we talked about this before. UCLA has had like this past season, they had one of the most decorated and talented freshman classes. Um, and Chris wasn't able to deliver as head coach with them. So there are high expectations on Janelle in terms of um, rebuilding the culture and also rebuilding the ability of them to get results. And I will want to, I do just want to add one more thing about um, BJ Doss um, staying on as assistant coach. I think. Um, UCLA goes viral based on their floor routines and their floor choreography. And so I think um, keeping their floor choreographer and their floor coach um, in BJ kind of reflects that in terms of their strength and their priorities to kind of continue that legacy. So yes. it's I'm very excited to see what happens with UCLA. Um, they've got some rebuilding to do, but I have high hopes for them, and I hope it's a good transition. I think also Sarah just tipped her hat on whenever she does the women's gymnastics season preview, her number one team to watch. Maybe she already tipped it that it's going to be UCLA, if she doesn't count her own school, Utah State number one. Yes. <laughs> and Fisk. And Fisk. Fisk, is going and Fisk. Fisk. There's so many teams to watch. Um, and then one more thing that I forgot to mention Um before we move on to uh, from the coaching shuffle situation is I think the thing that um, prompted me to uh, send you a message and say, we, this off season is bonkers and we need to do an, um, Mm -hmm. an update is in May um, shortly after um, her contract extension was announced just out of nowhere, Alabama's coach, Dana Duckworth suddenly stepped out. Aren't they good? So why'd she leave? They're really good. Nobody knows. So there are a lot of rumors, but not a lot of concrete reasons as to why. It happened very, very quickly. So Dana Duckworth resigned within something like 46 hours. A new head coach had been hired, Ashley Priest Johnston, um, who um, was a national championship winning gymnast at Alabama, previously coached at Auburn, was doing really good work there. So she just got 
really quietly, very quickly appointed to that new head coaching gig. Oh. Um, and she's been slowly building her staff as well. I feel like so, something was in place there. Not, 46 hours and you have a yes. new... I feel like there were some things behind the scenes that we will probably never know until a book's written, but something sounds a little fishy there. Yes. So there's lots of fishiness, not a lot of answers, but that's another program to kind of keep an eye on to kind of see where they go in the next few years. Because um, my sense is like not all is fully well in Alabama, um, but we'll find out. So coaches weren't the only ones who were shuffling around. There's also some gymnasts who were with the fifth year uh, graduate transfers because of COVID and things like that. I was also yes. going to ask too, does women's gymnastics, do they have like a, do they have a transfer portal? Or, okay. They okay. Do. Yes. So just, just like the rest of um, mm -hmm. college sports, um, the transfer portal is a new kind of a relatively new. It's free um, age. It's free age. You know, the policy surrounding that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. So between the um, transfer portal situation, you know, the rules changing, and um, the fact that anybody who competed, and this is true for NCAA, all NCAA sports, um, everybody who competed during the 2021 to 22, 22 academic season or season or whatever, academic year of season, student athletes, got an additional year of eligibility. And so because of that, we're seeing a lot of gymnasts, um, seniors deciding to take a fifth year. So Trinity Thomas is one um, who decided to stay um, for a fifth year. There are a ton of seniors who are staying for a fifth year, which is really exciting. But we're also seeing a lot of fifth year graduate transfers. So um, gymnasts deciding, you know, they finish their academic program at their undergraduate institution. They want to go to grad school, but they want to continue doing their sport. And so we're seeing more uh, really high profile gymnasts transferring for their graduate school program and taking their fifth year at a totally new school, which is super exciting. So one of the most exciting, and I think this follows well from our discussion of UCLA earlier, is Nora Flatley from UCLA uh, is taking her fifth year at Arkansas. So, so Nora was one of the, um, she was one of the gymnasts from UCLA who uh, advanced to mm -hmm. nationals individually. She was their all-arounder. Um, she's one of the top all-arounders in the country. She had an amazing season um, coming off a couple of years of injuries. And she's also been a really vocal leader and supporter of all of her teammates at UCLA. So um, with the um, kind of turmoil and situations um, UCLA has been going through, she was one of the more vocal gymnasts speaking out about that um and so she decided for her fifth year she wasn't going to be a brewing anymore she wanted to transfer elsewhere so she used to be coached by jordan weber um, so jordan weber who's the head coach at arkansas used to be at mm -hmm. ucla and so uh it was a very natural transfer for her to move to arkansas so um a lot of the gym internet is very, very excited for Nora to kind of have this fifth year season, be in a new environment, and to, you know, just have a fifth year. Um, and so I think everybody's just excited to see what she does for Arkansas, what she does at Arkansas. And uh, I think everybody is hoping for the best. There for was her. two also people that you had too. Michigan lost someone to Utah, and Utah lost someone to yeah. LSU. Yes, exactly. And so, like, I'm not sure of all the um, stories behind all of these. These are just kind of like a highlight. Abby Brenner is one of Michigan's best and brightest. She was on the um, team that won uh, nationals two years ago or, yeah, mm -hmm. last year. And so she got poached by Utah. So she's going to go do her graduate school at Utah. And um, something kind of fun to see is that um, – in her club days, you know, before she got to college, she was training with a couple of Utah's current gymnasts. So she was able to transfer to Utah and be with her former teammates, which is really exciting. And I think Cammie Hall moving to LSU is really exciting as well. Uh, so Cammie is one of Utah's or was one of Utah's best bolters and was able to just really excited to, you know, be there all the time. And um, LSU has a great vault lineup that they're going to, like Cammie will fit really well into. So yeah, uh, all these 
all these transfers are a little head spinning for people who are kind of used to seeing certain gymnasts wearing certain colors. And, uh, um, and then one more that happened earlier this week. Um, so I don't know. Um, we don't talk too much. I haven't talked too much about SEC gymnast, gymnastics. Wait, S um, SEC, from... like Florida and all of them? Yeah. Well, I mean, we definitely talked about them, but um, <laughs> there are a lot of stories. I guess I'd say that um, there, there are a lot of stories that uh, come out of the SEC gymnastics and we don't, we haven't talked about. I was going to say, them, fair you know, enough. Just... I was like, we talked about the SEC for like <laughs> two months straight. That's true. Yeah. But there are, there are a lot of things in the SEC that we don't talk about. because There's just so much to cover. But um, have I talked to you all about the um, the Bauman sisters? No. See, I actually, I wouldn't know that. Oh, okay. if you yeah. So Alyssa Bauman and Rachel Bauman are sisters. Obviously, they were both, um, oh, I think they were both an elite for a while. But when they got to college, um, Rachel Bauman went to Georgia and then Alyssa Bauman got recruited by Florida. So they're both in the SEC. Um, and every year that they have been in the NCAA together at the um, when Georgia and Florida compete against each other, um, the gym internet calls it the Battle of the Bowmans. Oh, and so uh, their mom and dad cute. have these t-shirts. They have these t-shirts they made that are like half mm -hmm. Florida, half Georgia. Super fun. And so um, this was Rachel's senior year at Georgia. So everyone was sad, like, oh, the Battle of the Bowmans is going to be over. Um, and so just this week, Rachel Bowman announced that she is transferring to Florida for her fifth year. And so she gets to be with her sister and they get to be teammates. And that's, I think that'll be really exciting. That's just another fun story that came out of this COVID fifth year graduate transfer story, you know, between transfer portal and COVID, we're seeing these just really exciting dynamics um, that we don't see in other, in other seasons. So. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> one of the last thing you are going somewhere this weekend uh, yeah. at the time of whenever this episode comes out, it might have already happened, but you are going somewhere this weekend. Where are you going? Yes. So I am going to an elite gymnastics meet that just happens to be in Salt Lake City this year. Um, so this meet's called the U.S. Mm -hmm. Classic. And it's kind of, um, it serves a couple different purposes. It's the final opportunity for elite gymnasts to qualify for national championships later in the summer. Um, and then it's also um, often used as kind of a tune-up meet. So a lot of the top gymnasts who've already qualified just kind of use it as a dress rehearsal. I actually went to this meet back in 2018 when it was in Columbus. And kind of a fun thing about that meet that I went to was it was Simone Biles' comeback meet after taking her year, well-deserved year off after the Olympics. So yeah, that's happening in Salt Lake City. And so um, my friend Kimmy, who is Boise State's biggest fan up in Boise, um, she and I got a hotel room together and we're going to hang out and probably debrief together on all the craziness in the college off season and enjoy some, some, you know, elite level gymnastics. So um, another kind of exciting thing about this is kind of beyond the scope of what we often talk about. Um, but men are going to be included in this meet for the first time. So in addition to watching all the best women in the country compete, I'll also get to see men's gymnastics live for the first time, which I'm super excited. Does about. your friend know you have a podcast? I've mentioned it to her, yes. Um, she might be fun to have as a guest. Oh, you run um, the women's gymnastics program. You just let us know. <laughs> um, but yeah, so on the, I guess, keeping it uh, kind of tied to NCAA, mm -hmm. there is one current NCAA, NCAA women's gymnast competing there, Leanne Wong from Florida. So uh she was one of the all-arounders to watch at nationals. Um, she was also a USA Olympic alternate last summer um, and is the reigning world championship all-around silver medalist. So she's a big name um, who's continuing her elite career. But there are other Olympians to watch and other kind of people to watch. Um, Jade Carey has said that she intends to try for world championships this year. So there's a good chance we'll see her at nationals and vying for world championships. Um, Jordan Childs has also been training elite. Um, SUNY is starting to get involved in the elite world again, but she has said that she probably won't compete 
internationally until 2023, which good on her. Take a nap, Sudi, Suni, for goodness <laughs> sake. Like, <laughs> she's had a lot going on. Yeah, but overall, um, a trend we're seeing that I think is really exciting is um, NCAA gymnasts continuing their elite careers while they're in college and also beyond. And so I think in the next several years, we're going to see more and more overlap between NCAA and elite gymnastics. So another dynamic to keep an eye on. Sarah, when does the season start? Um, NCAA Mm -hmm. season? Yeah, so official season usually starts in January every year. Um, But in terms of training, that'll start in November, and we'll start seeing inner squads and such around December, kind of end of fall semester for a lot of schools. Okay, Okay. just putting that for the fans out there so they can expect when they could potentially hear your preview episode of the season. But, Sarah, that's all we have for today. Is there anything else you wanted to add? Oh my gosh. I don't know. I've been reflecting a lot lately on um, just kind of being a grad student and being busy Mm -hmm. all the time um, and trying to have work-life balance. Gymnastics has been a source of joy for me in this whole process. Um, And it's been fun the past couple of years, just having that like passion and that source of joy grow. Um, And so Yeah, I guess, like, uh, I just highly recommend women's gymnastics as something to follow and be a source of joy. But, like, you know, I think also, you know, sports and just more broadly, whatever makes our listeners excited is worth chasing unapologetically. So I guess I'll leave everybody with that. Oh, that was great. Only thing I just want to add to that is, like, obviously, graduate school, law school, medical school, any school past even undergrad, it's could be very stressful because obviously you're now just not working towards a grade you're working on towards the rest of your life of trying to get a career and all that and like you said you got to have a balance if you don't have a balance it's just going to be a terrible experience for you and you're not going to like what's going on around and you found it in women's uh, gymnastics and it's very entertaining and even through all your busyness you're able to shine a light on it here so we greatly yeah. appreciate it, and we greatly appreciate you having you back from the hiatus. Yes, it was great being here. Thanks oh, so no much. No problem. And with that being said, thank you, everyone, for listening to the L7C podcast. Make sure you like, rate, comment, subscribe. Uh, Sarah is actually not going to be gone that long. She also has a special episode that she'll be having in a time to be determined where she's going to be joined with some other people that you have listened on here so we are just waiting for when sarah wants to do it to see if everyone else is available and that one will be interesting because this one encompass encompasses something that is very prevalent in the ncaa today and i'll leave you with that and with that being said thank you everyone for listening to the l7c podcast signing out Thank you for listening to this episode of the L7C Podcast. Be sure to like, rate, review, and subscribe to the channel. Follow us on all social media platforms, and we'll be talking to you guys soon. Take care.